Okay, first of all, can you hear me, Cheng? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'll try to speak uh, loud and clear. And I will first share my screen with you if it works. So let me see. Okay, and I have. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So first of all, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I wanted to attend in person, but uh, I had a medical appointment I couldn't miss. Actually, things seemed to be okay, but I couldn't be with you physically. But I actually attended two workshops or conferences of the Pontifical Academy first in June and then in July, together with Susan um, uh, on the resilience. And let me just first say that I talked about the limits to resilience and the limits to adaptation, because as I will show in a minute, if we go too far in the direction of global warming, then I don't see any possibility or very slim possibilities to really, yeah, help with that at the global level or the regional level. So my theme will be, and this is opening a, a new door with the Pontifical Academy, <laughs> as my title says, Saving the World by Construction. So my main argument will be, we will probably overshoot 1.5 degrees, two degrees, as stipulated in the Paris Agreement. And we need to stop global warming, of course, at the lowest possible level, maybe at 2.2 to 2.3 degrees, and then work back actually towards something like one degrees warming. So this is a tremendous, a tremendous task. And in the meantime, our capacity to be resilient and to cope and to adapt will be tested. Yeah, by our planet. Uh, that's the situation we are in because we more or less lost three decades where the science was pretty clear already, but politicians and the public didn't pay attention. So, but there is a nature based solution, actually, the co transformation of land use, forestry, and construction, which can help us to, if you like, restitute, restore the atmosphere. And that is my major theme. And this was a workshop we had in June. I think it was a, a quite remar remarkable gathering uh, where we had keynote speakers like Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, head of the European Commission. On the right-hand side, you see the German Minister for Construction, Clara Geiwitz. We had world-class architects, world-class scientists, of course. Uh, it was a remarkable event, and it was only possible by the generous support by Joachim von Braun, Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, and Cardinal Turkson. So I think it was fairly unique because it was truly transdisciplinary, reaching from atmospheric science to, well, how do you convert communities where you have lots of social tensions and so on. So I will refer to that in particular, and the name was Reconstructing the Future for People and Planet. So there was a direct link to the Vatican and to the Pontifical Academy, because in the encyclical, encyclical letter Laudato Si, paragraph 44 and 45, you have a direct reference to the built environment, uh, which in my view was neglected for a very long time in the public debate about global warming, biodiversity loss, destruction of soils, land use change, and so on. So I just uh, read one sentence from paragraph 44, that is, Paul Francis says, we were not meant to be inundated by asphalt, glass, and metal, and deprived of physical contact with nature. And this is a theme very close to his heart when he was uh, still acting in Buenos Aires. He was very concerned about the built environment. 
So I try to show you now why urbanization of the built environment is such a big problem and why it is actually defining what we call the Anthropocene. So let me see whether it works. Yes, it works. So this is a movie that shows you how the big world cities emerged over time. So we are now 3,000 years before the common era. And you see in Mesopotamia, Ua, and others, cities emerging. Uh, and the first one on the western part of India, you see nothing. Oh, now Memphis emerged in Egypt. Nothing, of course, is in the Americas or in Australia and so on. And we go now forward and now Mykene, Troy, and then Polis in, in Greece uh, appear. And then we have seen on the other side of the Atlantic that the Aztec culture has created the first cities. Rome emerged. Now we are moving towards the modern age. When you see through the Roman Empire in Europe, you have a number of cities. You have many in China by now, of course, when uh, the first cities in the Inca culture pop up. Now we are moving towards what we call the medieval global temperature optimum. We have fairly warm centuries, uh, the 11th to 12th. When the whole thing stagnates a little bit because we have the Black Death in the 14th century, but still you see all over the world it is appearing. Now we are entering the Industrial Revolution. We have an acceleration, but now the whole thing explodes. And this is the urban world we have today. And this is exponential growth, not only of population, but you know, land use, ceiling of surfaces and so on. And this monster has to be tamed somehow. And if it can't be tamed, we will, of course, have accelerating global warming, we will have a loss of biodiversity and so on. So in my view, this is the crucial part and the crucial element in the climate equation and in the land use equation. So we made explicit reference in that workshop to two giants who have been members of the Pontifical Academy and dear friends, Mario Molina and Paul Kutzlen, you know, the latter, he coined the word Anthropocene, the age of humankind or geology of mankind here. And this is exemplified by this paper in Nature, which was done by a group from Israel, Weizmann Institute in 2020. It just shows that in the year 2020, the anthropogenic mass, which is concrete, bricks, asphalt, metals, plastic, and so on, uh, overtook and surpassed the, the living biomass on Earth. So the living biomass on Earth was, before the Industrial Revolution, about 2,000 billion tons. And it was reduced by the Industrial Revolution and by our modern economic activities to only 50%. But we have replaced that more or less virtually by man-made uh, uh, materials. Uh, with a tremendous amount of fossil fuels uh, used in order to produce that. And this means tremendous amounts of CO2 that went into the atmosphere. So in a way, the elephant in the climate room is really the built environment. And of course, Susan has already made uh, a brilliant uh, sort of summary of what is happening right now. So we have in Europe this year, the summer drought. Uh, and this is where the limits to resilience and adaptation can be sort of summarized. This is a brand new paper just appeared in Science uh, by a number of colleagues of mine, where the so-called tipping elements in the Earth system, so a notion I helped to introduce a long time ago, are scrutinized at which temperature point uh, will 
this element, say the Amazon rainforest, the tropical coral reefs, uh, the Greenland ice sheet, at what temperature level will these elements be tipped into disappearance, destruction, transformation, what have you? And you see on the right hand side, uh, the bottom uh, right hand corner, you see the thresholds, so global warming less than two degrees. You have this orange color when you have this diamond shaped two to four degrees warming, global warming, when you have this red triangle larger than four degrees warming. So if you find a diamond there, say in Africa, the West African monsoon, it means according to the best science we have right now, it will be tipped into a different state uh, in the range between two and four degrees warming. Huh? The sad story is that this meta-analysis shows that we have a number of orange circles here where less than two degrees already lead to, probably lead to a transformation of this element. So West Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet are probably in that camp. And that means if these two ice sheets are going to be melting actually over the next centuries, this will add 10 meters to global sea level. And that means in the coastal zones, there is no adaptation. The only way of resilience is when migration. And this is one of the sad things that we are already on course towards tremendous global challenges. And also, Fred, we just published a paper in PNAS, uh, but the first author was Lou Kemp from from uh, Cambridge, whom Martin Reed, who is also attending, knows very well. And this was called The Climate End Game. This paper was downloaded, I think, 150,000 times in the first week. And it's exploring catastrophic climate change scenarios, which we have to avoid by any means, actually. So in my view, my narrative is now not, oh, yeah, we have to mitigate, and of course, everything what Susan said about photovoltaics and wind energy, that's all true. We have to reduce emissions to zero globally by 2050 at the latest. And then we will try to adapt to what is happening. But I think it is climate restoration. I'll just show you in a very, very schematic way what I mean. So you have on the horizontal, line simply the time, so 1900, 2000, and you have global mean temperature change, that is global warming, one degree, two, three, four degrees. Now, what we have since 1900 is a warming of up to now 1.2 degrees. And under business as usual, something like this will happen. So we will move by the end of the century into three degrees warming, and warming will keep on going because of the feedbacks in your system. So in my view, the only realistic option we have is overshoot and return. That is, try to stop global warming around two degrees, maybe a little bit above that, and then work yourself back, as I said in the beginning, towards 1.5 and one degree. Because all these tipping processes I was referring to they will, they need in a way a sustained global warming of the centuries, which is far beyond what we have so far. So if we turn back, of course, some things will happen already, but most things can be avoided if we come down quickly enough from global warming. So the overshooting, what can be done for overshooting uh, and when returning? Well. This is our new proposition. The built environment is now the worst villain in the climate game because of cement production and so on. Cement production alone is responsible for 8% of the global emissions uh, you have steel and so on. But it can become the greatest hero actually in the climate game because as we showed in this paper, Nature Sustainability, if you build from 
wood from bamboo, from organic materials, uh, and you have long-lasting houses, for example, you store, safely store the carbon from the atmosphere because the vegetation is feeding on our emissions in a way on our CO2. And if you do it at a global scale, then you can actually clean up the atmosphere from historic emissions. Huh? A new paper showed just how it can be done, how many areas do you need? You have to recultivate, reforest, degraded land, but we have plenty of degraded land on this planet, unfortunately, about uh, a billion hectares and so on. So this shows where it could happen. And the main uh, proposition, the value proposition is what I call the forest reconstruction farm. So you, of course, in a sustainable way, manage the forest. You log, you take out timber, you replant, of course, immediately. You can extend forest areas. We should also do what Jane said. I mean, nature-based solutions, sea grass, salt marshes, heats, and so on can suck up tremendous amounts of CO2. Within the construction sector, you try to recycle, of course, the timber, so you can build houses five times from the same elements and so on. And this is acting like a forest reconstruction pump. And I give you the bottom line of that. In order to restore the climate, uh, and this is a back of the envelope calculation, you need to add and support about 500 billion trees. We have enough land, degraded land for doing that. And you have to convert about 2 billion homes into yeah, carbon stores because they are built from harvested biomass. Huh? And this would be enough to remove about 100 ppm CO2 from the atmosphere. And this happened in the past, in the carboniferous age, by natural solutions, so to speak. But of course, over millions of years now, we would have to do it over 200 years. So, so all this is uh, reflected in I think uh, a remarkable statement, uh, which was made by the participants and hopefully will be signed by everybody, called Reconstructing the Future by Reentanglement. Reentanglement means reentanglement of technical sphere with nature again. So high tech meets no tech, if you like, but also reentanglement of social strata within a city and overcoming functional disentanglement. And this is, in a way, reflected by the new Bauhaus movement, Bauhaus Earth, a charity I helped to create recently. We have Ursula von der Leyen's new European Bauhaus. And it's all referring to this wonderful, holistic vision, which was created by the original Bauhaus in 1919 in Weimar, in Germany. So it's about a new deal with the built environment. And actually, I have the privilege next week, uh, Germany is hosting the G7 this year. And for the first time ever, there will be a ministerial meeting, construction and accommodation and the housing ministers will happen in Potsdam, my hometown. And actually, I have been asked to give the keynote there next Tuesday. And I will refer and I will use actually the results of that wonderful workshop we had in the Pontifical Academy. So there is a direct line from Rome to Potsdam in this case. So thanks for listening. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much indeed, John. Uh, are there questions? Yes. Thank you, Jen. Uh, very interesting session indeed. I enjoyed your uh, intervention as well as Susan's and Hans. You know, when uh, you are a paleoanthropologist like myself who has access to the past and how things changed over time and how they in turn impacted our trajectory, uh, you what you said in terms of uh, uh, adaptation and interconnectedness and uh, nature-based solutions to our uh, challenges are ultimately the solutions. Uh, 
yes, we can mitigate challenges, but ultimately we need nature-based solutions. So I completely agree with you, and it resonates. Uh, you, you, you know, in the past, you had those many, you know, human ancestors that came and, you know, went, and there was a reason for that. It is the adaptation or lack thereof, and we are faced with that type of challenge now, whether we mitigate or adapt is going to be critical uh, to our future as a species. And I want to reflect on two things. First, uh, when uh, you know, smart people like you uh, advise uh, policymakers, which is much needed, uh, how much is the need for public education uh, uh, put part of the conversation? Uh, because it's important to teach policymakers indeed, because they ultimately take the call. But when I see that resources, say, for museums of natural history, where people could actually learn about how interconnected they are, the need for adaptation and mitigation. Uh, when I visit museums across the globe and their resources are really dwindling, uh, how much of uh, the impact that you know, people like yourself have or my, my neighbor here could help us really inform the policymakers to also know that public education about climate change and many of the challenges is critical. Uh, uh, you know, uh, many people don't know that there was no ice sheet in the Northern Hemisphere, only three million years ago. There was no ice sheet, it was empty. And the Sahara, which is now pervasive, comes and goes. It was a green belt at some point. So environments do change. So uh, what I'm getting at is, is public education and dissemination of scientific knowledge part of that bigger conversation at the highest level? And it's not necessarily just for you, but our friend from Paraguay or Uruguay was also mentioning those. I just wanted to ask to reflect on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, no, thanks for, uh, this was not only a question, it was a comment which is full of insights, of course, and I fully agree with you, but in order to respond to your question, I mean, how to communicate things. Yeah? Um, with policymakers, of course, it's it's difficult because you have two minutes or five minutes, uh, and then you have to explain extremely complicated things uh, in very simple words, and they have no patience at all. I mean, Susan Solomon showed you before how you can turn very complicated things in a very clear uh, narrative, so to speak. Um, what works, in my view, with the public and with policymakers are two things, and we debated this also here at the Pontifical Academy several times. One is a good narrative, and second, a good example, so to speak. Yeah? The narrative means you have to tell a really good story. I was telling you the story of overshoot and restoration, if you like, yeah? but with the help of nature, we can restore our planet, and it will be only based on nature. Yeah? A good story where people would like to be part of in the end. Uh, so a politician would like to be the one who has understood this and started with. Actually, I told Ursula von der Leyen, I think, a very good story, and she embraced it. And she came here to Rome uh, for two days and was uh, giving a keynote lecture and so on. So that's the one thing. And the other thing is, in particular, in a built environment. And this is not just European or American architecture, it's very often traditional vernacular architecture and so on. You have to show people that you can live in a much better way together with nature, for example. So we had at this workshop fantastic examples from Indonesia bamboo village, for example, where people build their houses from bamboo and they plant the next house already in the garden behind the the house, it's fantastic. It's completely circular, completely nature-based, uh, and it also helps actually, if you do it in the right way, to support biodiversity. So a good story and a good illustration, 
And we in the background, of course, do all the science uh, and we do the calculation of it will add up. That's our responsibility. Yeah? But once you talk to someone on people on the street uh, or, or to people in the parliament or in the government, you have to come up with a good story and you have to show them a few yeah, enlightening examples. That is all I can say. That is the, my experience from 40 years of science. I started out as a theoretical physicist, uh, done some fundamental work on, on quantum mechanics, on the foundations of quantum theory. But in the end, you have to be a good storyteller. Thank you so much for that, John. I see that uh, we've got hands up. Uh, Martin, would you uh, care to comment? I'd like to raise two different points. Uh, first, really, the question of the politics and the role of the G7. Uh, it seems to be clear that it's going to be very hard to get anywhere near net zero. Um, unless it's got the uh, cooperation of the Global South, where by 2050, there'll be 4 billion people whose per capita energy consumption is now very low mm. and is almost certainly going to increase. Mm. And surely a priority is to ensure that those countries are able to uh, leapfrog directly to mm. clean energy, just as they have leapfrogged directly to smartphones and never had landlines. And uh, doesn't this really require um, a massive R&D program in the global north to improve clean energy and storage and to bring down the costs? Uh, that, that's a major political question, uh, maybe for Dr. Schumacher. But could I raise a second, um, more specialized question? I happened to be reading just yesterday about a plan to improve a sequestration by genetically modifying plants mm -hmm. so that they have deeper um, and uh, larger roots. Um, is this a sensible and feasible idea? Oh, yeah. OK, Martin, two, thanks. Two very different questions. Yeah. No, no, uh, both questions are, yes. of course, extremely relevant. First of all, on the Global South, I mean, you're absolutely right. I'm just preparing my presentation for the G7. Uh, and uh, Africa in particular will be in the focus uh, because where you, when I was born in 1950, you had 250 million people. Now it's a billion, it will be two or three. And probably the most populated or the, the biggest cities by the end of the century will be Dar es Salaam, Kinshasa, and Lagos. Uh, so, I mean, the fate of the planet will be decided where. But although these people are not to be blamed in any way for global warming because their contribution is very, very minimal, actually. Uh, what two things on that? The first one is it's not just about clean energy. As I tried to say, is it will be the way we construct our future cities, uh, the materials we use, the structures we use, uh, the services we offer. This will really decide because we have calculated if in Africa alone for the next billion people or so on, you would do it in a conventional way with steel and concrete, but would already push us beyond the 1.5 degrees. Yeah? So sunshine and wind and biomass, that goes without saying in a way, it has to be accelerated, of course, but it is really the material flows. We have talked about energy flows, but we have not talked about the flows of matter, and only if you do the two things together, we can restore the planet. So, and on that, I mean, we have all even uh, sort of uh, <laughs> uh, discovered what is in my in my mind. Uh, I at that meeting with Ursula von der Leyen in Rome, I tried to actually. Um, win her over and, and 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 make her actually aware that in particular Europe, I cannot speak in any way for America or China or whoever, but for the European Union, that the European Union, hopefully with UK <laughs> included, Martin, we need a new deal with Africa. Huh? 
we need to accelerate all types of innovation, but in particular, nature-based solutions. Eh? Because when it comes to natural capital, the Congo is much richer than Saudi Arabia, for example. Eh? And if they use this natural capital in the right way, you can achieve a lot. So I think Europe should actually come to a, a, a very intense uh, new partnership with Africa on these issues. Now on the genetically modified- uh, John, we're plants. running late, so please make the yeah, response yeah, brief. Yeah, just one Thank sentence. You. We had a wonderful workshop here, uh, which was chaired by Joachim von Braun. Uh, and yes, uh, we need to use this option. We have to explore it. We have to use it in a very safe way. But yes, absolutely, this is part of the ensemble of solutions we have to offer. And yes, but even applies, of course, to trees, because when I talk about reforesting, maybe 200 million hectares of degraded land, it has to be done with the species that really survive right? global warming. We have uh, two more questions, uh, and I'd like to do them uh, back to back before we have any quick responses. So please make them yeah. very, very brief, both the questions and the responses. We have one online and one in the room. So please go ahead with your question. OK, OK, can you go ahead? On, on mute yourself and okay sorry um i'm not taking your back but that should be for not a question observation and comments on susan Solomon's talk i was raising my hand then but i was not told please uh, about the points to ponder on it interests me so much that the implications of impacts of resilience water culture and then flooding and what have you the most uh, 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 touching implication should be considering the sustainable, de uh, sustainable development which we, the African continent, needs. And invariably, you can see that even with what is listed, it is all immediately touching our economy, environment, social states. And you know that when these three states are not, I will use phrases, neutral equilibrium, there will be no sustainable, never we, shall we have sustainable development. So as we are considering, we put that into a, a play to know that when we are considering and trying to know what to do, we have to note that both the economy, environment, and then social status of a nation, particularly we, the African country, are being touched on. Thank you very much. Yeah, I so, totally agree with you. Um, I could have definitely made a long list of all the reasons why uh, we, we absolutely have to work on sustainable development. I, I guess the only thing I'm going to say, and it sort of gets back to what we talked about earlier, is that another reason why sustainable development is so urgent is that if we put in place infrastructure, which is not sustainable, which is not oriented around a clean energy future, then we're locking into another, you know, you put in a power plant, it's a 50 year commitment to emitting even more. So we can't let that happen. We have to now be thinking constantly about sustainable development being the only pathway forward. So it, it's, that's why mitigation can't be ignored and how it has to be thought about in this context. So thank you. We have one quick question behind me, uh, and then we will conclude the session. Uh, the quick remark is about education. We had in uh, this academy several workshops on climate change, and uh, the issue of education was there. And John, thank you for supporting it and, and contributing to the proposition in this. Uh, since then, my own experience is that teachers have great difficulty in grasping climate change and to make it understandable with these simple narratives for, for their students. Well, there, there is some progress in that, 
But on the other hand, the eco-anxiety is becoming a real problem for young children in, in school. And this seems to me to be worldwide. I have seen that in, in Africa, in, in Latin America, as well as in Europe. So uh, this strategy of uh, adaptation and, and mitigation has also to be uh, communicated to teachers to help them. And mm -hmm. I would just like to say here yeah, that it needs the, the science community to help because the task is immense. Uh, just a, a very quick comment, Pierre. Thank you. No, uh, yes, this was an important workshop. What and if you tell a good story, people have to be at a certain level, of course, of of education in order to even understand it. So that's absolutely crucial here. And what I learn actually is that I get many, many requests now by schools. Uh, from teachers to come and to give a talk in the class. Uh, and maybe we just have to do it. I mean, we have very little time, but probably we have to simply overstretch our capacities in order to provide that type of education. Uh, and you're right, this is the key to the future. Thank you. So thank you all to uh, both of the speakers as well as uh, those who have posed questions. I think this was a really rich session. We could easily go on for quite some time, but we don't have that luxury. Uh, I want to just note that uh, just these presentations as well as the synopsis of the workshop really do illustrate the integrated nature of human development, peace, and planetary health. Uh, which is what this whole session is about. Uh, and we've touched on not only the science, but the importance of communicating the science to policymakers, to school children, to the public, uh, through effective techniques such as narrative, storytelling, examples, and also solutions that work. And while the challenges are incredibly daunting, keep in mind that social systems are as highly nonlinear as the biogeophysical system. They're characterized by tipping points. And part of what we are trying to do with the transformations part of the three pillar agenda from the resilience workshop is focus on what is it gonna take to get to those social tipping points where we can have the truly transformative changes that are needed to get on with the program of mitigation and adaptation and the societal and economic transformations. So thank you to the speakers. Thank you to uh, everyone here in the room, everyone online. And Mr. President, I return the microphone to you.